Well, as Justin said, we're in a series on, um, on in Ephesians, and this morning we reach the second chapter, Ephesians 2, and I'll read the first ten verses. <clears throat> and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked, according to the course of the world, according to the prince of power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. Remember that at the outset we shared that in, in the book of Ephesians, the first three chapters are all to do um, with belief, They're all, and the remaining three are to do with behaviour. So the first three chapters, it's duty, and... Um, oh, sorry, in the first, I've got that wrong. The first three chapters... Uh, it's doctrine, and in the next three chapters, it, it's duty. So there's a balance here. So we're continuing, Paul is continuing to lay a foundation of belief for us from which we can act. Remember, because uh, I did that one, I know Justin shared last week, but you know, in the first session we looked and we saw that we were chosen and adopted by the Father, we were redeemed by the Son, and we were sealed by the Holy Spirit. And I'm sure, amongst other things that Justin would have shared last week, is the fact that we have, um, he says, you know, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Yeah, get clear vision spiritually, that um, you may know the hope of his calling, the riches of his inheritance in the saints. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know whether it was emphasised, I haven't quite caught up with last week yet, but... Let me just say that, that we are his riches. <laughs> That's his, his inheritance is us. And he, he regards that as richness. And then we saw, of course, that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is working in us also. So can I suggest, perhaps you do this anyway, if you get a knock on the door and it's uh, our friends, the Jehovah's Witnesses, just say to them, oh, good morning, it's lovely to see you. Um, I've been chosen by the Father, adopted by the Father, redeemed by the Son, sealed by the Holy Spirit. I have the hope of his calling. Do you know that I'm the riches of, his, uh, riches of his glory in the saints? Do you know that the same power that worked in Jesus to raise him from the dead works in me? Now, what did you want to say? <laughs> <laughs> and... Having done that, I can tell you what will happen. Usually there's <coughs> silence, and then, oh, just a minute, I need to get someone else. Yeah, okay. Uh -huh. And it's a privilege to be regarded as a special case. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, having done all that, Paul looks this morning, uh, as he writes, and as we look at Ephesians 2, we're looking at our spiritual position in Christ. And it begins to get personal. And you... And let me just read that from the New Living Translation. And you, once you were dead because of your disobedience, your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Why is there trouble in the world this morning? Because of the prince of the power of the air, who controls so many things, controls the media, controls everything. That he, you know, that's the problem. All of us used um, 
uh, to, to, to go that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. But our, by our very nature, we were uh, subjected to God's anger, just like everyone else. And Eugene Peterson, uh, in his message translation, says this, it's a wonder that God didn't lose his temper and do away with the whole lot of us. <laughs> Summarising as, you know, Eugene Peterson only could. Um, you know, every child, every one of us, at some stage, in varying form, asks three questions. And maybe uh, you can remember asking your parent that, or you're in the position where your children are asking you that. <coughs> Dad, what's wrong with the world? And that question then progresses. Dad... What's wrong with the people in the world? And then when they get a little bit older, the question is, what's wrong with me? About a hundred years ago, a newspaper ran article, an article on what is wrong with the world. And someone called G.K. Chesterton, and many of you will have heard of him, Chesterton was a Roman Catholic, he was also um, a, a, a theologian, he was also a philosopher and a writer. And he wrote in response to the article, Dear Sir, in response to your article, What is Wrong with the World? I am yours truly, mm. G.K. Chesterton. And that's the issue, isn't it? You know, <laughs> we can be the cause of everything unless we ensure that we're living as we were reminded this morning in worship that we're allowing the rain to fall you know <laughs> perhaps some pe pe people I, you know say oh we sang that so many times this morning yes you did because this afternoon you'll be thinking and you will be singing let the rain fall that's the purpose of these things to get it into our heads we need the rain Philip down there is crying out we certainly need the rain literally on the on the soil but we need it in both ways you know we need the reign of the Holy Spirit. Because if we go our own ways, you know, it's disaster. Man in his follies has sought all kinds of solutions to what is wrong in the world. In 1920, following the cessation of hostilities in the First World War, the League of Nations was formed. And this was formed in order to solve all international disputes. Ha <laughs> ha. 1945, the United Nations was formed, and this also was to solve disagreements and um, altercations between nations. <laughs> Not doing too well, are they? Problem is, you can never get everyone to agree. That was the problem with the League of Nations. The problem with the United Nations is you never get everyone to unite. So, and then we look at it on a personal level. We thought, well, the best way to improve mankind would be Let's deal with, let's get everybody educated. Let's improve education. Let's pour millions into education. Rightly so. We want people to be educated, but it won't solve the problems. Some of the biggest menaces in the world are the brightest people, academically. We thought, well, we'll deal with poverty. That's the great problem. Let's get poverty dealt with, so we increased welfare. Quite right. All these things are useful. Where there's oppression, let's get rid of oppressive government. Let's change the government. But my friends, unless we change the hearts of men and women, nothing is ultimately going to happen. We're just going to repeat it uh, ad infinitum. You could give people the best things that this... Um, well, I use this nation, it's the only one I've really any experience of. We can give the best that we can afford. And you get dysfunctional families. The royal family. Some of the children have been to the best schools that you could ever imagine, have the best of everything, but the family is dysfunctional. You can look at uh, the poorest people in this land and you find, you know, dysfunctional families. You can find people who are well blessed financially, who are functional. You can find poor people who are very functional. There's no guarantee of how you're going to work this out unless you change. The heart of people, you can pour so much into a thing, but nothing's going to happen unless we're touched by the Holy Spirit. Christianity 
is not about making good people better. Christianity is about making dead people alive. You know, having mentioned the royal family, let me say we praise God for our Queen as we come up to this Jubilee. She's followed in the footsteps, <coughs> literally, of her father, King George VI, but followed in his footsteps in terms of Christian belief and faith. I think I shared recently the story of of uh, uh, one of the servants bringing King George VI his tea in the morning and finding King George VI kneeling in his bed praying. Mm -hmm. And King George VI, the man would just turn around and said, I'm so sorry, Your Majesty. He said, put the tea down, kneel down and pray with me. We're all one before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Mm -hmm. And the Queen, as we understand it, knows the Lord Jesus as her Saviour. But wonderful things can come out of the most tough backgrounds. George Muller. George Muller was a drunkard at 14. He was a gambler. He was a thief. Um, on the eve of his mother's funeral, uh, he was drinking. And yet he comes to Christ later in his teens and becomes one of the greatest um, gifts to the Christian life that we've ever had. If you want to read an interesting history, read the history of George Muller. It will do you good. By the, today's standards, simply by faith, by believing Jesus, by today's values, he raised £113 million pounds for the use of orphanages, founded 121 schools, etc., etc. My friends, when Jesus Christ gets hold of us, anything is possible. You know... Cemeteries are pretty sobering places, aren't they? I mean, they, they, they really are. Not much happens. Uh, it's pretty dead. You know, I can remember uh, on one of my trips to Nepal, most of them were for business reasons. I was working with the International Nepal Fellowship. But on one trip, they took me on... Um, uh, what do you do? Come on, Alistair, when you go, not a hike, a trek. They took me on a trek. But anyway, the day before the trek, I just wanted a bit of time on my own. So I went down to a beautiful river called the Shaiti River. And I sat by the Shaiti River. And I watched these ladies coming down the hill, carrying piles and piles of sticks. And very quickly, I came to realise that where I was sitting was, in fact, where they burnt the dead. And it all became fairly sobering as they were being brought two bodies down the hill to be burnt, as the Hindus do, on a funeral pyre. But the next day, we climbed, and we climbed in the Annapurna range, and we walked up to whatever it was, 15,000 feet, to the Annapurna base camp. They said, get up in the morning, John, get up early, five o'clock, we set our alarms, because as the sun falls on the Annapurna mountains, they are gold. The white glistens like gold. Now where would you rather be? Trapped. Sitting in a dead cemetery. Sitting in with a dead heart. Sitting alien to God. Sitting there moaning about everything that's going on in life at the moment. Or would you rather be ascended on the mountains enjoying the glory of the wonderful things that God has created? You know that's perfectly possible because... <laughs> because God in his mercy sent Jesus Christ he sent Jesus Christ down from the glory as the old spiritual song says down from heaven to earth as a friend of mine I'll never forget hearing him preach as he would say he said can you imagine what heaven was like the night before Jesus was sent to earth Oh, don't do it, Lord. Send Billy Graham. Don't, don't. <laughs> send some. Don't send Jesus out of glory. But God, in his mercy, sent his only begotten son. And he came to dwell on earth with mankind. He came to save his people. He came to transform them. He didn't come to make the better best. He didn't come to make... Um, the good, gooder. <laughs> he didn't. He simply came to ensure to make dead people alive. 
And so we become alive when we are seated in Christ Jesus with him. Everything becomes new. And verse 4 is one of the, you have to be careful when you preach in America and you say this, one of the great buts of the Bible. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. By the grace of God, I've been a Christian now for over 50 years. 50 years ago, I believe this message was absolutely wonderful. I want to share with you this morning that 50 years later, I believe it's even more wonderful. There's not a day goes by when I don't become more convinced about Christianity. I mean, the world's doing pretty well on its own, isn't it? I mean, I, sometimes I think mankind ought to get together. Let's all get together in Piccadilly Circus, ring round, run round Eros saying, Hallelujah! Praise God for mankind! He's created hell on earth. Because that's what he's done. It's only Jesus that transformed. Not only did God raise Christ from the dead, but his mighty power, by his mighty power, but by that power, he also raised us from the dead. Five things that God did for us um, uh, to, to save us from the consequence of sin. He loved us. By nature, God is love. He made us alive, even when we were dead in sins. And he raised us up. Our physical position may be on earth, but our spiritual position is in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And the fourth thing is he keeps us and he'll keep us, keep us to eternity. So you can see the progression. Jesus comes down from the Father to save men and women who, whom God has given him, who will yield to his love and to his grace. And then he says this, he says, you know what? He says, I don't want you to sit there in misery. I want you to know where your place is. Do you, do you get miserable? I'm going to be honest. I do from time to time. I get miserable when I forget who I am. <laughs> when I forget who I am in Christ. Oh, I don't know what we're going to do here. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Was it, was it water? Somebody prayed this morning over finances. Yeah. I've been there. You've been in that place where you've had to pray over your finances, but you pray over them. Oh, I don't know how we're going to do this, you know what I mean? Oh, I don't know. I suppose I'll have to sell me bike. But you know what I mean? But God is rich. And as we submit things to him, he shows the way. But then he says it's better than that. He says, just as the Father... And Jesus are in glory. You can sit in that heavenly place, even though you're on earth. Now I can't stand the chairs. That's not going to make the illustration very great, is it? Do they go like that? <laughs> well, actually, it's even better. Thanks, God. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> you see, in the family of God, folks, we really do need each other. I need Steve. On occasions he might mean, need him. I need this guy all the time. I mean, we need plumbers, we need electricians, we need accountants, we need teachers. What do you do? Design. We, yeah, we need design. <laughs> we need retired people because we're stronger together. But to go back to the illustration, that's it, you see. I sit in a heavenly place. And you know what? When I'm in that heavenly place, I look down on my problems. Just as I had that experience in Nepal, and you can have it here, you can climb up the hill at the back there into the woods and look down on Stowe Market or whatever you want to do. But remember, that's your spiritual position also. You've been lifted and raised with Jesus Christ. He says, that's your position. And it enables us to look down and see our problems in a different perspective. I'm sure like so many of us here, when we face the difficulty, what's the first thing we do? We pray about it. And Rose will say to me, she said, you're rushing ahead with this. She said, have you prayed about it? 
<coughs> and occasionally I might say that to her too, but you know what I mean? We just bring it before the Lord. And he's the one who sustains us. He will keep us in all eternity. And then quickly it says here, for we are his workmanship. I think it says in one of the translations, I think it's the NLT, for we are his masterpiece. <laughs> and we are there to, to do the good works that he's already prepared us for. What's the good work that God has prepared you for? So, my friends, remember, that's the spiritual position. Oh, I can get it off at least. <laughs> but don't go back to the old, the old chair and just sit there moaning when actually, don't get into the place of moaning. Get into the place of divine perspective where you can see things from God's point of view. And as I shared recently, you know, it's so vital if I... If I carry nothing else through life, Lord, enable me to do this, to look at life with a divine perspective, not to see, to begin, and to continue to process life through the supernatural, that I may see the natural problems with supernatural health and strength. For well, great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Well, a short message this morning, simply this, remember that we are seated with him in Christ. Mm -hmm. And all this, and we've got another chapter or so, or, uh, all this is to lay down the foundation. It's not bad, folks, is it? You know, as Dave Richardson would say, if you want the accurate version, just read the word of God, but just look at the first three chapters. It's incredible. And then Paul goes on to say, once you've grasped that, then you can look at your marriage, then you can look at how to bring your children up, etc., etc. Then you can look at one another, how you treat your workmates, your employees. It's all there. Everything's there in the Bible for us to understand. And then you can look at how you overcome when you get attacked in the Spirit. Loving Father, thank you. Bless you. All a bit clumsy this morning. But Father, I just pray. Pray for all my brothers and sisters. Lord, that we may help one another. Um, just as Justin put the chair straight for me, look, may, may, may we just make it easier for one another to sit in the heavenly place in which we should be. And Father, we really do need that. Father, there's not one of my brothers or sisters this morning that said, well, I've come to church this morning, but I've got this problem, I'm just so over-encouraged. I'm just bursting with over-encouragement. We all need to hear Jesus say, well done, thou true and faithful servant. Mm -hmm. And Father, we need to recognize love amongst our brothers and sisters. So bless us, we pray. And may we go and fellowship whatever we do later today, just remembering we're seated in a heavenly place in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen.